All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at the Center for Global Security Research within the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. My name is Asmar Askedom, and I'm the Associate Deputy Director of the Center. Today, we have Dr. Pepe De Biazzo here to lead today's lecture, which is entitled The MDR Missile Defense and U.S. Strategic Competitors An Evolving Approach. Dr. De Biazzo has been working on missile defense issues for multiple decades and has national security experience in the federal government, think tanks, and in academia. He is currently a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, and a professor in Missouri State University's Defense and Strategic Studies graduate program in Washington, D.C. From 2000 to 2021, he served as the director of the Office of Missile Defense Policy at the U.S. Department of Defense. He also once served as a DOD senior advisor to the U.S. Defense and Space Negotiations with Russia in Geneva, Switzerland in the early 1990s. Per usual with CGSR lectures, Dr. De Biazzo will present for about 30 to 45 minutes, and then we'll turn uh, to the audience for questions. So, Dr. De Biazzo, welcome to CGSR, and thank you for taking time out of your day to speak with us today. I'll turn the floor over to you to get us started. Great. Thank you, Asmara. Everybody, can hear me okay? Communications okay? Okay, great. Uh, well, great. Uh, once again, I want to thank you and Brad Roberts and his team for uh, for hosting this this uh, uh, discussion. When Brad asked me to uh, come and speak to to the group uh, three or four weeks ago, he was sort of open ended. He said, you know, we'd like you to come and talk about something interesting in the, the missile defense review, you know, maybe, you know, decisions or choices that were made in the MDR or decisions or choices that were not made in, in, in the MDR. And so I, you know, I gave it a little thought and a lot of interesting aspects to these big defense reviews, right? I mean, it, they, there's kind of a rhythm to them. They occur, you know, every four years, and there's one on the national defense strategy, nuclear policy, missile defense, and other topics, space, and and, and cyber. Uh, so there, you know, there there are always some some interesting aspects. Uh, but what I thought I would do today is is kind of there seems to be an interesting development that that occurred within this MDR, and, and to some extent was. Uh, I think started in the last uh, MDR, and 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 has sort of been reflected in this national defense strategy and in the last national defense strategy, with regard to to sort of missile defense and the great powers and uh, Russia and, and and China, great powers, strategic competitors, uh, you know, depending upon you know, the, the term right that 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 you've you've chosen to uh, to use, and and so I, I kind of built a, a little bit of a. A narrative around this idea of whether our, our policies and our strategies with regard to missile defense are evolving with regard to, to Russia and, and China, and and uh, you know so there have been some interesting developments in that regard, and so I'll go ahead and, and kind of lay lay those out, and and it will be interesting to have a, kind of a conversation and, and get some views and, and reactions to these to the to these things. Uh, so let me start. Uh, right, the recent MDRs, including the the Biden administration's 2022 MDR, right, point to a, a shift in the role of missile defense with regard to the to the to the large uh, powers. Right, Th this shift, to be clear, is still sort of in the in the formative stages, and, and so I don't want to kind of oversell, sort of oversell the idea, but but, but I think there's something that's in, that's happening here that's that's kind of interesting. Um, Despite the fact that that I think this development is in its formative stages, these policy reviews do call attention to changes occurring in the strategic environment, uh, in which the large powers are developing a sort of whole host of new kind of vulnerability pathways, right, to the United States or or, or to or to our presence uh, overseas. And I think these are related to the growing prospect of of limited conventional and or nuclear missile strikes. Which are anchored in uh, the deterrence and limited war fighting strategies of both Russia and, and China. And that these raise uh, sort of new questions over long standing US policy, which has largely dismissed uh, almost any role for missile defense against right, the big powers. So, in this context, the recent reviews make certain choices 
signaling an increased willingness to consider right, a role for missile defense within the larger U.S. military posture to address missile threats from, from Russia and, and China. To gain a better appreciation uh, of the potential implications of these choices, my, my remarks are going to be, will begin with a brief review of, of where current or extant U.S. policy stands on this matter. Many of you are probably familiar with that. Uh, and, and then with regard to the large powers, and, and then this will be followed by discussion, uh, discussion on sort of three, uh, what I think are kind of related or interrelated aspects, right? Regional missile defense against the big powers, homeland cruise missile defense against the big powers, and ballistic missile defense against the big powers. And I'm going to kind of stay, you know, sort of at the 30 or 40,000 foot level and sort of just lay out some of the topics and, and issues, which, which I think, you know, over time will probably get more and more attention, uh, both inside and, and outside of government. So let me spend just a few minutes kind of laying out uh, the foundations of current, current policy. Uh, I mean, current American missile defense policy is largely anchored in, in the 1999 uh, National Missile Defense uh, Act that was uh, passed, uh, you know, 20, uh, gosh, some 23, 24 years ago. That, legisla that legislation set a national policy to, to quote, right, deploy as soon as technologically possible an effective national missile defense system capable of defending the territory of the United States against limited ballistic missile attack, whether accidental, unauthorized, or, or deliberate. So since 99, right, every administration, including the current one, has developed policies within the framework of the, of, of the NMD Act sort of centered around the defense of the United States against nuclear armed long range ballistic uh, missile threats from so-called so uh, rogue, rogue states. This reflected the judgment then and, and, and continues to reflect the, the judgment that, that nuclear deterrence may not be fully reliable in preventing these, these rogue nuclear states, right? Rogue is still used to some extent, although it's, it's, it's sort of fallen out of favor, but, We'll sort of go with that because it's kind of the most commonly understood uh, term, right? Uh, that that the, the, it reflects the judgment: nuclear deterrence may not be fully reliable against these these uh, unpredictable states from seeking to threaten uh, missile attacks or employ such weapons uh, against the United States or its interest in a, in a crisis or a conflict. At the same time, each administration since the National Missile Defense Act of '99. Each administration has also pursued a policy seeking to, to reassure right, the large powers, Russia and China, that U.S. homeland missile defenses in particular are not designed or intended to counter their strategic forces. Right? The U.S. has consistently affirmed its policy that it relies on nuclear deterrence and the threat of re retaliation to address the large and sophisticated right, uh, Russian and Chinese uh, nuclear missile capabilities. And both the Trump 2019 MDR in the Biden administration 2022 MDR, right, pretty much use these exact same sort of declaratory policy uh, uh, words. Now, the, the, the declaratory policy that, that rejects any role for missile defense of the homeland against large powers, right, remains, uh, all of you, uh, I'm sure, familiar with this, right, remains rooted in sort of the Cold War, Cold War notion that, that mutual vulnerability provides a, a basis for stable deterrence and removes incentives to engage in arms racing behavior. I'm going to, you know, as lawyers say, I'm going to stipulate that that statement. Uh, I, I find elements of that statement sort of problematic. Um, but the fact of the matter is that view has sort of been the predominant uh, uh, par paradigm for, for many, many sort of decades. Moreover, this view has been sustained uh, by the arguments made by right, a number of missile defense critics that the feasibility and cost associated with countering large scale missile strikes by big powers would at any rate right, prove uh, too difficult to, to overcome. And so for well over three decades, Democratic and Republican administrations have endorsed this tailored approach uh, to, to, to ballistic missile defense, to, to homeland missile defense in, in general, but I'm going to argue to, to BMD actually sort of writ large, even, even, in, the, in, the convent, even in the regional sense. Really, that is treated rogue states uh, differently from, from established uh, nuclear powder powers on the matter of missile defense and U.S. Uh, US defense uh, strategy. American policy shaping the question of regional missile defenses has been somewhat less 
contentious. Such defenses are generally viewed as essential to the conduct of modern conventional warfare in light of the large and varied regional missile capabilities of potential uh, U U.S. opponents. Yet even here, I, I would argue, U.S. policy in the regional context has been inconclusive with regard to, to Russia and China. While U.S. policy has not distinguished states against whom it would or would not build uh, regional missile defenses, as it has done so with its homeland missile defense strategy, for much of the post-Cold War period, the focus was squarely on the regional powers, regional actors, and the prospective employment of missile capabilities in, in, in regional wars. In fact, there is little discussion, for example, within the leading policy and strategy documents over the last three decades, right? If you look at quadrennial defense reviews, if you look at national defense reviews, if you look at nuclear posture reviews, BMDRs and, and MDRs up to up till 2019, uh, you know, on the question of regional missile defenses, uh, you know, we've been almost silent with regard to Russia and China. And there's there's sort of a whole set of reasons for that silence. And it had a lot to do with the relationships, right, that the U.S. had with Russia in the post-Cold War era, and the relationships and the way it viewed China in the post-Cold War era. But the bottom line is we, we said very little, even with regard to regional missile defenses in the context of, of Russia and, and China. So I contend that you know, the changes are occurring in the strategic environment, and they are captured in part in recent defense reviews that foreshadow a prospective role for missile defense in American strategy towards, towards Russia and China. And so let me start with, start with a drink of water first. So, so with regard to this idea of you know, the extent to which we're seeing some evolution in American policy, in a different direction. Let me start with the topic of regional missile defense. So uh, as I just noted, right, most Cold War, post-Cold War assessments did not, con did not conclude that either Russia or China posed a regional missile threat to US interests war warranting policy recognition as a military problem to be addressed by missile defense, right? I mean, that's a very important uh, sentence, right? I mean, I, 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 I've, I've, I've been sort of personally involved in every missile defense review, even though we didn't call them missile defense reviews, go, going back to, going back to the, uh, the early 1990s. And, and, you know, across the board, we, we rarely identified Russia or China in any kind of declaratory policy sense uh, with regard to, to even regional missile defense. However, the assessment of the security land landscape began to shift in 2018 with the national defense strategy and the acknowledgement of the reemergence of the of long-term great power competition with Russia and China. One significant aspect of that competition is an increased recognition of the substantial strides Russia and China <clears throat> are making in developing new generations of long-range offensive weapons to include advanced ballistic missiles, advanced cruise missiles, and, and hypersonic weapons, for example, right, to support anti-access area denial strategies that are intent, clearly intended to degrade and defeat the, the ability of the United States to project military power, to sustain combat operations, and to support alliance security commitments in Europe and Asia, right? In short, A2AD, right, is key to both Russia and China's theory of regional, of regional victory. In this context, a policy role for missile defense in responding to the rise in prominence of Russian and Chinese regional missile uh, forces in their, in their respective warfighting strategies was explicitly identified for the first time in the 2019 Missile Defense Review, for the first time, right? It declared, for example, that the U.S. would strengthen its air and missile defenses to deter and defend against regional offensive missile attacks of both Russia and China in addition to rogue states, right? And that, so that was pretty significant. Uh, and we hadn't really talked about Russia or China in the context of right regional war fighting strategies, the regional offensive capabilities, the role that missile defenses might might uh, might play. We, we in the 2010 BMDR there was there was a little bit of language that said you know we're going to kind of keep an eye on China in the Asia Pacific region, but but it was it was it was pretty inconclusive with regard to you know declaring sort of a clear sort of policy objective and clear policy role for missile defense that occurred in the 2019 uh, MDR. 
Uh, interestingly, the 2022 MDR, right, that has recently been completed and, and released, uh, I think, in a, in a short version, uh, short unclassified version, the 2022 MDR reaffirms this policy from the 2019 MDR and the Department of Defense is in fact starting to take steps to fund the development of significant missile defense capabilities that are explicitly geared to countering China's offensive missile posture in, uh, in, 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 in Asia. Two, two quick examples in that. And one of the more significant regional uh, missile defense uh, initiatives coming out of the 2022 MDR, right, is the defense of Guam. Uh, and it, the defense of Guam in the context of the national defense strategy, the 2022 national defense strategy and the 2022 missile defense review, uh, clearly are anchored in uh, examining ways in which the U.S. can protect this key sort of strategic hub in Asia Pacific against the sort of growing kind of uh, Chinese regional offensive capabilities, you know, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles and, and hypersonics. And in fact, the, the administration's FY23 budget that was submitted to Congress, I guess at the beginning of this year, uh, February uh, timeframe, right, re request investments of around $800 million for a range of activities intended to uh, lay a foundation for sort of air and missile defense, or what's uh, commonly now known as integrated air and, and, and missile defense. Uh, so the department, uh, the, the army, the navy, the missile defense agency are beginning to collaborate on what an architecture might look like that includes both air defense capabilities and missile defense capabilities, right, to protect uh, the island of Guam at least for a certain period of time, right, uh, against uh, a Chinese attack in, in the context of a, a sort of a you know larger Asia Pacific uh, conflict. The second interesting uh, step that the, the Department of Defense is taking with regard to regional uh, missile defenses and the big powers is it's pursuing a concept known as the Glide Phase Interceptor, right? And the, the Glide Phase Interceptor program, uh, which is funded at about a quarter of a billion dollars in the FY23 budget, is focused on demonstrating a capability by the end of the decade to provide the United States a more capable long range system to, to, to engage and defeat uh, Chinese regional hypersonic, uh, hypersonic threats. So that's kind of, uh, I don't know, thread or line of effort, sort of number, number one, if you will. The second issue is related to Homeland, uh, Homeland cruise missile defense. And, and here again, there are developments that are occurring in the threat and security environment and that have been captured in uh, recent defense reviews, right? That raise questions about the desirability of retaining a policy that dismisses any role for missile defense against Russia or, or China. And so in the context of Homeland cruise missile defense, the Biden administration in, 20, in, in the early part of 2022, right, released uh, what was called the, the NDS, the National Defense Strategy Fact Sheet. This was actually before the NDS um, full document was released, which occurred, right, I think, uh, just last, last month. And, you know, there's a really kind of interesting uh, assessment, threat assessment in, 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 this, in, the, in the NDS uh, document that calls attention to this, this sort of this risk. And I'm going to quote, it says, recognizing growing kinetic and non-kinetic threats to the United States homeland from our strategic competitors, the department will take necessary action to increase resilience, our ability to withstand, fight through, and recover quickly from disruption. So that's pretty interesting. I don't recall, you know, at least a, 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 a kind of a, a light being shown quite to this extent on both sort of what the 2022 NDS refers to as non-nuclear strategic attacks against the United States, right? And, and, and then it, it sort of defines these, right, as, as kind of kinetic and, and non-kinetic threats. The non-kinetic threats, right, we, we can, we're all certainly familiar with um, uh, the, the cyber activities. But, but one area in particular associated with growing kinetic threats, right, is Russia and China's 
fielding of advanced long range cruise missiles that can launch from the air, land or sea that are capable of destroying targets within the United States, right, within the United States, right, to degrade the ability of the United States to project military power and sustain combat operations and support security commitments across right, Europe and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, now, this is important because the longstanding American operating model has, has almost always assumed that the United, States, the United States can project military power globally from a safe and secure homeland. And that the judgments in the NDS and by state testimony by recent Pentagon uh, and, and military officials is that you know that ability is is eroding as a result of Russia and China uh, moving forward with an ability to bring their anti-access area denial strategy to to the U.S. Uh, to, to the U.S. homeland. The significance of this NDS assessment, right? This assessment in the 2022 NDS is also affirmed in the 2022 Missile Defense Review, in which the MDR uh, recognizes a shift in the military strategy of Russia and China, again, as elements of Russia and China's kind of evolving sort of theories and concepts of, of limited uh, warfare uh, against the United States, right, to quote, to stay under the nuclear threshold and achieve strategic results with conventional capabilities, including, including cruise missile capabilities, right? And that's from the 2022 MDR, right? To stay under the nuclear threshold and achieve strategic uh, re results with, with conventional capabilities. So this again, I, you know, for, for those who, who sort of recognize the importance of these kind of national defense strategy documents, right? I mean, they, they set the declaratory policy for an administration for at least four years and, and sometimes for eight, right? They drive uh, program budgets, they drive long-term investment decisions, they drive the development of new capabilities, they drive the development of our posture. And so, right, when a document as significant as the National Defense Strategy and the Missile Defense Review sort of collectively sort of point to these kind of evolving concerns over uh, uh, big power, uh, limited warfare concepts, right, that now increasingly look at the United States, you know, as a viable and, and feasible uh, target, right, to impact our ability to engage in military deterrence and defense operations thousands of miles away, whether it's in Europe, the Middle East, or in the Indo-Pacific region, right, then, then you know, I it's it's worth sort of taking note of 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 those of those <clears throat> uh, statements. So to, to address this risk, at least as we're thinking about the conventional strike capability uh, against the U.S., to address this risk, the the National Defense Strategy and, and MDR sort of endorsed the development of capabilities to deter and defeat specific threats to the homeland, including Russia's long-range cruise missiles, with a priority given to improving the ability to detect and track. These threats, right? So that was identified as the as the first priority. Uh, again, you know, as we look at the alignment of, of strategy, of policy strategy and resources, right? We it's important to always look at, at those aspects to see, well, is this policy sort of aspirational or is it actually driving the development of, of, of new capabilities? Uh, is, is, is it informing our investment strategies and, and, and so forth? And so in the FY23 budget. Uh, in support of the detection and tracking mission against new long-range conventional capabilities, particularly uh, Russia's capabilities. The 23 uh, budget invests almost 300 million for new over-the-horizon radars to provide, right, to use the, the, the jargon of the Pentagon, right, all, all domain awareness, but, but really trying to develop a sort of 360 degree capability against more sophisticated air breathing threats to the um, um, to the United States, really, which it would be essential to detecting uh, cruise missile threats uh, to the homeland. Additionally, the, the missile the 2022 Missile Defense Review states that the United States will examine active and passive defense measures to decrease the risk from any cruise missile strike ag against critical assets, regardless of origin. Right. Uh, end of quote. And and so this was another indication, right, when writing the Missile Defense Review to look at uh, cruise missile threats to the United States, regardless of origin, right, was intended to signal 
this isn't something that's simply confined to, you know, your traditional sort of rogue state actors. This is uh, focused on looking at what, you know, the capabilities and the threats that, that, that Russia and China, but Russia in particular present sort of uh, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in, 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 the, in the near term. So to, in order to carry out this work on homeland cruise missile defense, the department has designated for the first time a service to go build, uh, to go examine and build uh, an architecture, right? I mean, to begin to do the analysis. And for those who are even remotely familiar with sort of the history of cruise missile defense in, in the homeland, this goes back decades in which the United States really for a, for a variety of reasons, right? Just never had uh, a, sort of a concrete interest in, in thinking in a more kind of serious sort of nationwide way about sort of homeland CMD. You know, lots of history to this issue and lots of architecture and so forth. But it really wasn't until the recent sort of uh, NDS and, and MDR that there is, is a bit more a kind of concreteness, if you will, to, to looking at this. And so the United States Air Force, uh, the Deputy, uh, Deputy Secretary signed out a memo probably late, late this summer, which appoints the Air Force as the executive agent for, for uh, homeland uh, air and missile uh, defense. Uh, and, and so the Air Force is now working in collaboration with the Missile Defense Agency and, and the services, uh, uh, sort of looking at the issue of sensors, of shooters, of interceptors, of the kind of command and control that would be required, right, to protect sort of critical targets across uh, the United States. The analysis is sort of in the early stages, to be sure, uh, and so they haven't yet defined exactly what this, right, right, but this architecture uh, will look like. And so while important questions, you know, have to be addressed about the ultimate scope and scale of, of the Homeland CMD system, the benefits of some, uh, some defense capability here to deny Russia and China an unchallenged pathway to threaten the United States would appear to be growing, at, at least insofar as uh, are reflected in, 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 in the NDS and, and the MDR. So let me, let me go to uh, third and, and final sort of issue in this, you know, trying to frame up kind of the, sort of the interesting developments within, within these recent reviews on, on missile defense. Of course, the th third issue, I think, which raises some interesting questions uh, for us, uh, of course, also now bear on the, the policy uh, that has rejected ballistic missile defense, right, uh, for the homeland uh, against right, uh, Russian, Russian and Chinese threats. And, and you, you know, you, it, it, as you look at the, the National Defense Strategy, uh, the Missile Defense Review, and, and uh, even the Nuclear Posture Review, you, you certainly begin to see s some, some important developments uh, with regard to the limit, you know, Rush, Russian and Chinese right, threats of limited uh, first use of nuclear weapons against the United States, right? And, and, and the 2022 uh, NPR, right, uh, alludes uh, to this, uh, certainly in the, in, in a regional, in a, in, a, in a regional, in a regional context. So, so there is, there is an increasing focus on, on, particularly on, on Russia's policy its doctrine and its capability that envisions the, the prospective escalation of, of limited nuclear strikes against either possibly against the, the U.S. homeland uh, or, or its forces abroad to, 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 to coerce or otherwise compel the United States to halt or terminate its campaign in an ongoing conventional conflict uh, right, that is otherwise going badly uh, for, for, for the Russians. Um, you know, the director of DI described in 2017, and, he, and I quote, right, Russia is the only country that I know, that I know of, that has this concept of escalate to terminate or escalate to de-escalate. They have built this into their operational concept, and we've seen them exercise it. So, you know, as we collectively look at developments over the last four or five uh, years, I mean, up until Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Kind of this, the, the idea of escalate to, 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 uh, to de-escalate, right? The, 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 early, the possible early use of 
Russian limited nuclear strikes against the West, right? To either improve their prospects to 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 win a conventional war, or or to prevent right, you know, Russia from from you know a, a complete conventional collapse in, in a war. I mean, you know, there was there was there was some substance to this, but but until you know the last year or so, right, we're now getting almost weekly demonstrations of of how the Russians think about sort of the the course of nuclear use. And even the, the the remarks by the director of the DIA back in 2017 are in, insightful, right? For those who kind of pay close attention to these, because what he's saying is we see both intent and capability here behind Russian uh, escalate to deescalate. We see them uh, training, we see them exercising it, we see it in their in their in their written kind of uh, uh, sort of military strategies. We, we we certainly see the presence of these capabilities, and so it, you, you know you you sort of see a, a kind of a combination of intent and and capability here, which is sort of what led right the U.S. as far back as five years ago to conclude, right? You need to to understand sort of what we're what we're seeing, uh, and 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 I'm suggesting right in in the context of Russia's kind of escalate to de-escalate con concept, right? There may be a potential role. For missile defense, right, and this is something that's just not, right. We we haven't thought a lot about yet, but there may be a potential deterrent role for missile defense in addressing, right, this strategic problem, and 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 namely that problem is to deny the coercive and blackmail value of of Russian missile back threats in a crisis or ongoing regional conflict by negating the political and military value of limited strike options or cheap shots, as some say. Uh, you know, our, our very own Brad Roberts, right, has, has, has been writing about these kinds of things now for, 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 a, for a number of years. So, um, uh, 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 giving Brad some, some, some kudos and, and so hopefully he'll, 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 he'll watch the, the, the video of this and, uh, uh, and, and note, recognize that, that I continue to sort of pay attention to the things he's, uh, he's writing about. But look, under conditions of, of, a, of a deteriorating regional conflict, right, U U.S. nuclear deterrence, I mean, so the argument goes, and as people like Brad have, have written, right, may be insufficiently reliable to prevent the threat of limited nuclear escalation with Russia calculating or miscalculating, right, that the political military benefits of a limited strike in a conflict that's going horrifically bad for them, right, outweigh the possible sort of U.S. Uh, US response, right? Uh, under these circumstances, you know, missile defense sized to defeat a fairly small limited coercive uh, threat or attack may provide an additional means to reinforce the credibility of broader U.S. deterrence threats by diminishing Russian confidence that it could threaten nuclear escalation against the U.S. homeland, right, uh, in, 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 a, in a failed, in a failed, in a failing conventional war. I mean, I want to kind of emphasize right that this would be a limited defense this would not be an attempt to develop a large-scale defense against a large-scale attack but it would be intended to reinforce deterrence right to continue to make sure that russia understands that there are no options anywhere along the escalation chain or, or within the hierarchy of escalation where they could carry out such uh, contemplate such attacks with the possibility that they might they might succeed, right? And, and and in this context, right? I mean, this is where we ought to be thinking about both the denial component of deterrence and the and the retaliation or response component of, of deterrence, and and recognize that there may be instances where these two components of deterrence can work together in a in a in a in a synergistic way, right? To to strengthen the overall fabric of deterrence. Right, and if deterrence fails, right, uh, offers some means to, to limit damage and uh, to to the United States. Uh, that said, the above notwithstanding, right, the 2022 MDR did not make any changes in this uh, regard. Right, it did not take any decisions to sort of relook uh, specifically at the role of homeland BMD vis-a-vis -vis the large, right, the large. Uh, the large powers, right? I'm similar to the 2019 MDR, the 2022 MDR, sort of simply, you know, kind of restates, right? U.S. declaratory policy that 
uh, that the United States relies on its strategic nuclear forces, right, to address right, Russia and, and China, and that its missile defenses are not designed or developed to, 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 to cope with or to impact, right, uh, the strategic capabilities of either Russia or China. So for now, U.S. policy sort of remains unchanged in, in that particular uh, area. However, it's sort of just as a kind of a get off the stage uh, kind of thought. I think as our as as American deterrence and defense strategy kind of continue to evolve in other areas related to to, to missile defense, to to the to, to the notion of active defenses, it may be increasingly difficult to avoid a more serious discussion over reassessing the role of BMD in the homeland defense context. Uh, as well. Uh, and so let me sort of stop there. I mean, I don't have a, a good answer for where that debate goes, but but it it, it I, my own my, my own ex experience doing this for decades suggests that, you know, as we as we reassess sort of what the nature of Russian and, and Chinese concepts and theories of of limited warfare look like and, and, and those increasingly include the potential of uh, conventional and, and or nuclear limited strikes against the homeland, the role of, of defenses, of active defenses, and the role in the context of, of, of denial, right, as, a, as an element of, of an integrated deterrence construct, if you will, if I can steal the, 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 the term from the 2022 NDS, uh, you know, is is worth is worth examining. It's worth sort of arguing over and 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 debating about. So let me kind of stop there and sort of open it up to to you know, thoughts and questions and comments on this topic. Thank you.